he is the favorite as the vice presidential candidate for presidential candidate Donald Trump. He's Doug Burgum here on The Will Cain Show. Governor, great to have you. Hey, Will, great to be with you. Fun to be here with your team, uh, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, you got some fans. You got some fans, Governor. And I don't know how much you watch Fox News, but I've, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't cast my lot. You know, I don't, I don't say I'm a supporter or I try not to cheerlead. I just try to analyze and give the authentic opinion of where I am. And I've noticed from the presidential debates onward, you know, you, you've got something. You had a message that I thought was important, you know, and I don't know. I don't know if it was a populist resonating message that was important to me and what I was saying. But you seem to be a little bit different on that presidential stage. And now here you are, the betting odds say, front runner for vice president. Well, I, 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 I'm, as far as the betting odds, uh, you know, I, I laugh at that because a couple months ago you couldn't do a 10,000 to one bet on me. And then somebody told me last week you're leading. So, I mean, it's like I, uh, it, you, you, you've been in sports, Will. You've uh, covered that. You know how sometimes a, a sure thing looks like a long odds and vice versa. But we're out here really just focusing uh, on campaigning for President Trump because I'm still the sitting governor of North Dakota. And I can tell you, as a governor of North Dakota, the biggest challenge that we have for the future of our state right now, for our economy, for our people, for our free ma major industries, uh, it's the Biden regulatory regime. I mean, the, the people talk about, you know, hey, we're, you know, they're worried about the future of democracy. Well, I'm living uh, in a threat to democracy right now because none of the the over 30 rules and mandates that we're pushing back on the federal government have come through Congress. They're not laws that have been passed. These are agencies, three-digit agencies, dozens of them that are, you know, pushing an ideology down on our state uh, that's, you know, raising the prices for everybody. It's destabilizing the world. It's uh, you know, undermining our national security. And it's, uh, these are, uh, and, and for, and again, for people that are concerned about where our economy's going, whether it's, you know, AI, crypto, any of those things, we've got to have energy uh, policy that allows our nation to continue to thrive, and we're competing against countries that uh, have on a very different trajectory in terms of their energy production. And so that's uh, that's going to help determine uh, where the world goes, right. and uh, we we've got to wake up and be be part of that future. And that was part of you know, I, like I said, I think that you had a unique. To me, um, a message that resonated in some of the issues you were talking about on the presidential debate stage. And I want to get into some of those today. We'll talk about China, and I want to talk about energy in particular. But I do want to get to know you a little bit. You know, I, I have plenty of opportunities on Fox and Friends to get your three, four, five, six-minute opinion on a specific policy. But I also want to get to know you as a man, as the leader. So let me just start light, because you brought it up, sports. Uh, are you a sports guy? You're North Dakota. Are you an outdoorsman? Like, what is Doug Burgum beyond a governor and and starting tech companies and sweeping chimneys? Like, what what do you do? What's your hobby? Well, I you know, growing up in a small town of Arthur, uh, we had uh, three sports in high school. That was football, basketball, and track. And man, I spent every minute I could. I was uh, you know hanging around. We only had one gym. That was the high school gym. Uh, but, you know, had had a hoop in the backyard and spent a lot of time, uh, you know, growing up and just, uh, play, you know, played basketball all the way uh, up until uh, last uh, August. Uh, I think people famously know. Right. What would you blow out? I blew my Achilles. You blew out your knee, your no, Achilles? No, I blew my Achilles, tore my, <laughs> ruptured my Achilles completely playing uh, some pickup ball at Marquette within 24 hours of the debate. So uh, you, you mentioned the debates, but yeah, I, I don't know if you, your audience may not have heard, but it was, I was voted, it was the best performance ever in a presidential debate by someone standing on one leg. So that was the, uh, that, <laughs> that was, I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm in the record books, uh, but yeah, I, so I love sports and have continued to stay active. Uh, in that, and then also, uh, you know, an outdoorsman. I mean, this is, I grew up in a place where you could, you know, literally sort of walk out your door and living on the farm where we raised our kids. I mean, you could walk out the door and hunt pheasants, uh, bow hunt, uh, cross country ski in the winter time. I mean, it is uh, the outdoors and and all of that is something that I've always loved, and one of the reasons I've loved living in North Dakota because it's always just uh, you know one door away from uh, being in the uh, beautiful outdoors. I have a buddy. Uh, I'm in my forties. I have a buddy who played pickup basketball and he just, he had to stop, uh, not unlike you, because one day he goes out there with a bunch of guys and he thinks he's hustling just like he did when he was 25 and he planted, I think he was in possession of the ball, but he just planted and he knew immediately something was wrong. And he said, it was weird. It's not pain. It's almost like an audible pop that you could hear. 
and and then just like a weird destabilization that it was his Achilles. He blew out his Achilles. What is that? What it was like? Did it hurt? Like when you blew the Achilles? Did you know this is this is real bad? Well, the the, the specifics of this, uh, having played uh, organized league ball and playing in in North Dakota, there's a great amateur basketball uh, hierarchy, and so having played on teams that you know we won uh, the A, which is sort of any age we've won the over 30 uh, you know played on a team even when I was governor we won the over 50 uh you know those are all fun but you play ball your whole life I was on the court three different times when someone blew their Achilles and yes there's an audible pop they go down uh they're in a lot of pain and then they'd be like who kicked me and then you'd be like well there's nobody behind you nobody kicked you and so when I went down and I've People said, what happened? And I said, somebody kicked me. And then I, I heard myself say, someone kicked me. And they said, oh, did you twist your ankle? And I said, no, I blew my Achilles. They're like, no, you didn't walk it off. And I'm like, no, uh, you heard what I just said. I, I'm pretty sure I can. I don't even need to see a doctor. That's what happened. And, of course, that's what did happen. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's a, t- it's a tough one. It's a long recovery. I mean, it took Kevin Durant 12 months. Everyone asked me, are you playing basketball? I'm like, hey, Kevin Durant was 12 months before he was back. I got three more months before I, I have to hit that timeline <laughs> back on the court. Well, your story and my story, my life story, have a um, an, an interesting commonality, an interesting similarity. Um, and I know you talked about this. I think you even talked about it on the debate stage. You lost your dad a- at a very young age. You were in high school. I think I think you were a senior in high school. I lost my dad when I was 25. Um, I had a younger brother. I have, I'm the oldest of four. My youngest brother was 15. He was a sophomore in high school. And I just know, I know, Governor, for me— uh, and I know for my brother, both of my brothers and my sister, that's a, that's a really formative thing um, to lose your father at a young age. So, so tell me about that. Like, what? How did that form your life? Well, my my dad was an amazing guy, World War II Navy vet who'd signed up after uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, you know, growing up in this town of 300, Arthur, North Dakota, didn't you know? We didn't have a pool. We didn't have a. There was no swimming hole. There was no river. I don't think even the guy knew how to swim. But he. Uh, like a lot of a lot of young men in that era, and then he, you know, signed up, uh, proposed to mom. They got married in Chicago, in a, like a six six people there. She didn't even have a wedding dress, and then they, you know, put him on a destroyer as an officer. And he, because uh, he had a college degree, they put him on a destroyer. He didn't see mom for two and a half years, and but he lived lived to tell about it. When I was a seventh grader, uh, he came down with a brain. Uh, cancer, brain tumor, probably related to some things he got exposed to during the war. And then, you know, he fought hard for two years, uh, but then, you know, we thought he was going to make it, but I was tying back to basketball. I was getting on the bus uh, on a Friday night in uh, in January and getting ready to go play Kindred, one of our arch rivals, and they uh, pulled me off the bus. And, you know, I was, uh, uh, I was like, hey, he'll be fine. He's always popped back before. And they're like, nope, you got to go. And then, he, you know, he passed away later that night. So that was, t- that was a tough thing. My mom then went back to work. Uh, she was a, she was incredible, you know, stay at home mom with a working on the school board, the church board, all that stuff. But she had to go get a job to help, you know, put food on the table and pay the mortgage and do all that. So she was. Uh, I, I understand what economic insecurity can look like from a single mom's perspective, and it was uh, you know incredible right. to incredible to see her. So I I learned a lot from both of my parents, and they were you know I, I feel it was a real gift where I grew up and to have parents like that. You know, Governor, when when my dad passed, um, you know, there are so many different places of emptiness left in your life. It's just, there's just a void. And one of the most obvious and tangible voids is, is, you know, I was at a stage in my life where I was I was I, I was needing to make the transition from a boy into a man. But but you don't have all the answers. So it's just a habit. Hey, I don't know. And it can be little stuff. I don't know how to fix this thing on my car. I don't know who to call in a certain crisis, but I always knew the first call was to my dad and, and like, Hey, I need some advice. And all of a sudden I just, I had a void of advice. I I didn't know, like, what's my first move, um, when it comes to getting some guidance. And I had to find new places for that. And I'll tell you personally, and I don't know if I've talked about this with the audience, like my friends who I have some very, very forget smart. I have some wise friends. They really filled that void for me. Um, and I'm just curious where you went, you know, Men, and you were younger than me, look for mentors. I, I don't know if I want to stretch it to say look for heroes. Look for places to model. Where'd you go to model who you wanted to be after you lost your dad? 
Well, like like you, Will, I had some uh, good friends, and uh, but I was uh, unlike you, where you were the you were the older brother, and I'm sure you were looking after your uh, younger siblings. Uh, I was the youngest of, of three, and I had an older brother uh, who was uh, you know, sort of stepped in a little bit into that father role, and and he was he was a, a great. Uh, you know, we were super close, and and I really relied on him a lot. And then sadly, he passed away in 2010. So I've lost my older brother, a guy that I really leaned on. But other friends, and then dads of other friends. And you're in a small town like that. I you know sort of had a chance to uh, pick the role models, the, the ones that I thought were the the ones that were doing it right in terms of how they were doing it. But I know that empty feeling. I mean, raising yeah. you know raising three kids. There's time plenty of times when I wished I could have asked dad, hey, how do you you know how do you, how do you do this? But uh, uh, you know, figured out. But my dad lost his dad when he was seven years old. So I kind of, when I lost my dad, I'm like, hey, now I understand my own father better because he he was trying to figure things out. Interesting. So we were, uh, and uh, one of my, uh, and neither one of my grandfathers, one of them passed away uh, decades before I was born, and the other one passed away when I was six months. So I didn't I didn't have any grandfathers in the picture, uh, and so it was uh, it was figured out. So that's I ended up again also with a lot of strong female role models, including my, my mom, who was, uh, who was just, uh, she was a rock and she was amazing. And so I, I feel fortunate. There's a lot of people right. in my life that helped set me in the right direction and coaches, you know, I'm there, glad was, you said there that. was some coaches that some coaches in high school that, that were at that, at that time when I lost my dad were very important. And that's probably why, you know, I got to focus on sports and probably bur- I buried myself into uh, sports as a way to maybe avoid some of the, you know, thinking about some of the other challenges. <clears throat> You know, I'm glad you said about your mom. Uh, it, it's a good reminder for me. I mean, I know. I just probably don't say it out loud enough. The the rock that was my mom, you know? And uh, I think it's because I'm just so male-focused. And, I, you know, I've always had guy friends. And I've surrounded myself with male model role models. But, yeah, I mean, the role that these mothers play is just beyond incredible. And, you know, they say on the friend thing, you're a product of the five people you surround yourself with, you know, um, you know, you surround yourself with a bunch of dummies, you're going to end up being a dummy. You know, you, you surround yourself with five intelligent people smarter than you, you raise your own game. I think that's true. And I looked at my friends and I'm like, not transactionally, it's not to be transactional in your friendships. You're like, hey, I can see how you add to what I want to be in this way and, and look at other people that way. So I kind of want to ask you about some of um, your relationships. So I've been intrigued by you for quite some time. And whenever I'm intrigued by someone, I also want to say, well, you know, what are the holes in the game or what are the criticisms? And you were on Fox and Friends last week, and my co-host Rachel Campos Duffy asked you about, you know, one of the sort of, you know, emerging criticisms out you. And I don't know if emerging is the right word. One of the present criticisms of you out there from the right. And it seems to be this idea that you are in some way, and we know some of the policies, and we'll get into some of the policies here, but in some way, sort of of a globalist mentality, um, you're a very successful entrepreneur. And I, and I struggle to find, Governor, where this comes from. And I know the policy it does, and we'll discuss the policy in a minute. But I think it also ties to your relationships, because that's what you and I are talking about, relationships here. And it's, you know, you sold your company to Microsoft, you're big buddies with Steve Ballmer, it appears, and you have a, a good relationship with Bill Gates. And I think that relationship, for me on the right, has created some skepticism. Tell me about your relationship with Bill Gates. Well, first of all, <clears throat> let me just go back to the whole, the globalism thing, which is uh, in how that, you know, again, I, I get, I smile and laugh when people try to stick that. You know, when you're a kid growing up in a town that didn't even have a computer, and then I end up, uh, you know, literally betting the farm. I mean, the small bit of farm ground I got from my dad that I inherited. That was the seed capital that went into Great Plains Software, where, we, you know, we started with, you know, 10 kids, basically. And then we, you know, built this thing uh, up. We went public uh, before we got acquired by Microsoft. I mean, we'd been around for uh, 18 years uh, before we got acquired by Microsoft. And during that time, we built a company of 2,000 people. We had 1,200 in Fargo, 400 rest of North America, and 400 rest of world. So even before I became, uh, we became part of Microsoft as a new division. All 2,000 of us became a, a a new, you know, Microsoft Business Solutions division. Microsoft. I had people working around the world in all these countries, and then in my role at Microsoft, I had people working for me in over 100 countries. So then you have people that are working for you that are and customers and partners that are living in countries where they don't have the right to free speech, they don't have the right to assemble, they don't have, they certainly don't have the right to, you know, bear arms. 
Uh, many of them didn't have the right to vote. So then when, if you're a kid that's grown up in the center of America, in what I call the best of America, the heartland of America, a place where, you know, today even still neighbors are helping neighbors and we've got, you know, low crime in, the, in spite of the Biden administration, the economy's doing well in North Dakota. Uh, I mean, among the you know fastest growing GDP, lowest, highest workforce participation, lowest uh, unemployment. I mean, there's a lot of positive things. It'd be better if we weren't being choked by Biden. But when you grow up surrounded by that, that's the America people dream about. It still exists. And it, that's the thing. But when I got a chance to see people that were working for us that didn't have the same freedoms that I do, and you're young and you're single and you're traveling and you're like, wow, that puts an impression on you because you just come home every time and go, wow, America is the best country in the world. And we're the, we're the country that everybody does look up to. So, so that when I, so the, the labels that people come up with, I think are kind of goofy because the fact that we can sell our products around the world that America, you know, like in technology, we've got the best stuff, not the worst stuff. Our stuff is the stuff that's, you know, help. I mean, technology and free markets have helped lift a billion people out of poverty around the world. And that was because of what was going on in our country. That was just a gift. I mean, it wasn't foreign aid. It wasn't spreading right. tax dollars. It was just, you know, us, you know, helping lift people up. And that's what America, what America what America does. So I, I think some of those, and then we, we got acquired by Microsoft and you asked about Steve and Bill. Well, those guys were, Steve was the CEO and Bill was the chief software architect. So yeah, I worked with those guys and Steve and I knew each other from, from grad school, but right now on the political spectrum, uh, there are plenty of people at Microsoft that are, uh, you know, supporting uh, for president, someone uh, different than who I'm supporting, which is obviously President Trump, because I understand how his policies work. Uh, but when you've got that that differenti- differentiation, I hope that we're still a country where uh, <clears throat> people can disagree and you know learn how to disagree better uh, with each other. But there are plenty of things where we've got you know completely opposing views on on how we on how we see the world maybe going going forward. Uh, <clears throat> but that you know that doesn't change the fact that you've got you know like with Steve, I've known Steve for forty years. Right. Yeah. No. And I, I I don't I don't think I'm certainly not, and I don't, wouldn't expect someone to. Uh, expect you to disavow your friendship, but just digging a little bit deeper. So I love the story you just told us, um, and but I don't think it absolves the idea. And I say this because I came from a small town in Texas. I'll always be from Sherman, Texas. But I know, and, I, and again, this isn't an analysis of you. This is in general just sort of talking about how it can go. Some people can appreciate where they came from. Some people want the world to be different than where they came from. And so being from that world isn't one that insulates you from sort of whatever the appeal is of globalism. And so back to the relationship with Gates, there is this mentality out there that we need to, as part of progress, strive beyond the nation state mindset, that we can help engineer a better world for everyone. And that sort of starts to wrap itself up into, you know, deferring power to, to, um, you know, the WHO or starting to organize economies from the level of the World Economic Forum. And whether or not those are good intentions or bad intentions, it does seem to think that the America first mindset that you've laid out and as as um, someone who is campaigning for Donald Trump, I would assume is something that you would say you support. There does seem to be some antagonism from somebody like Bill Gates um, to what you're now talking about today. America first. Well, like I said, certainly there's there's plenty of plenty of people in technology. Uh, you don't have to just stick in Seattle. You go to Silicon Valley. There's a lot of people there that have made a lot of money in technology because of free markets and because of the United States. And I don't, I don't understand why they uh, support the candidates they support, whether it's for Congress or Senate or for the presidency. So I've had uh, you know, a lot of disagreement for a, lot, a long time with uh, folks in the industry, same industry that I'm in. But when you're a governor, <clears throat> when you're a governor and you're you know competing against your neighboring states or states all over, we're competing for for talent, we're competing for uh, economic uh, capital that you know come to our state, don't go to the other state. So as you're a governor, naturally, I mean, it's kind of like, hey, for me, North Dakota first, you know, man, that's where, you know, we're, we want these, we want these opportunities, we want these jobs here. And then when you, so it's very easy as a governor who's been, you know, in the battle competing for talent and capital, which is what we do, what we, what we do at a state level to do that for America, America first, because we, we, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be letting, 
you know, millions of people pour across our borders and then have Canada, for example, have a policy where they take, uh, you know, we bring people to America, they get college degrees, even from our allies <clears throat> from those countries, and then their student visa runs out. We're exporting talented people with, that have gotten graduate degrees in, in, in our country. We export them at the same time we're letting anybody in unvetted. And then Canada says, hey, pay us a fee and come to Canada. Uh, and you know, and then they pick off like a million people that could be literally that have gone to school in the U.S. but now are residing in Canada. Well, Canada is being smart. They're our ally, but you know, they're they're competing for talent in a smarter way than we are, and that's why you get companies that are U.S. companies that have got you know operations set up in Canada because they can you know run a uh, you know run a development team out of Canada, thousands of people. So I I, I think America's got to be focused on America first in terms of capital, in terms of talent, and that's why you know President Trump. I mean, he gets it. You know, he's figured out that this tariff thing isn't about you know economists sitting in ivory towers at universities and trying to you do economic modeling. He understands it from a negotiating. Uh, one to one, you know, how to make sure that there's a level playing field for American companies. And he's not afraid to use our economic power, which we we should. I mean, when we've got nat- when we had energy security, we've got food security as a country, that's part of national security. And then we got the Biden administration going over and talking to China about uh, about climate when China's the world's largest polluter. They have to import 11 million barrels of oil a day, and they got to import calories. They don't have enough food to feed uh, the billion and a half people we have. And then we never use. I mean, you want to walk softly and carry a big stick. The U.S. economy is our big stick. Uh, but uh, you know, we've got an administration right now that doesn't know how to do it. President Trump knows how to negotiate with these countries, and as a business guy, I respect that he understands how to use the levers to help you know put America first and America workers first. We, we, tell me about your your um, let's call it migration to support for Donald Trump. I think everybody has had a migration in their support. Um, not everybody. Some listening, some watching may have um, understood Donald Trump from the very beginning. But I saw an article this morning on CNN.com about another campaign surrogate senator from Ohio uh, for Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, um, where they were laying out his past <laughs> tweets criticizing Donald Trump. And look, I'm going to be real. Like I had criticism of Donald Trump and, you know, it took me some time to fully understand the virtue um, of this of this leadership. But what about yours? I mean, have you always been a supporter of Donald Trump? I mean, you ran against him, so there's some level of a lack of support at one point. But what? tell me about when you started to appreciate him as a leader. Well, I think you go back to uh, <clears throat> May of 2016, uh, before, before he'd secured the nomination. I endorsed uh, President Trump for uh, as a— as a candidate running, I'd never had an opportunity to meet him, but I was as a business guy running for office for the first time. He was a business guy at a completely different scale uh, running for office. So when we both got elected in November of 16, I mean, that was a joyful night uh, for for me and for everybody in North Dakota, because I thought I was going to be, you know, become a governor uh, and have to be dealing with uh, Hillary Clinton. I had 36 days uh, as governor under Obama, and I can tell you that was not pleasant because the uh, uh, we know now from uh, you know federal court proceedings that the Obama Biden administration they had their you know thumb on the scale helping the the protesters at the Dakota Access Pipeline protest which I inherited my first day in office I had 36 days under Obama and it was a like a light switch went off when Trump came in but yeah I supported him uh, very early in that in that year. Uh, and then I support, endorsed him, of course, again in 2020 because we'd had, you know, having him as president and being a governor, uh, it was like a win at your back. I mean, he actually understands uh, that the states created the federal government. They understood that there's things if you're going to try to shrink the federal government, part of that, you've got to push that responsibility back to the states and the states we can push it back. Uh, we either either turn that back to uh, tax breaks for citizens and smaller government, or we can shove it down to the local level. Because I'm a guy that believes in you know the best decisions are made closest to the people, not not by bureaucrats. Well, like, what made you decide? What, what's that? What made you decide to run against Donald Trump? But well, though, what made you decide to run against Donald Trump? Well, that was that was a uh, for me it was as much about uh, the 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 issues that were being discussed as it was. It wasn't really about running against anyone because I, I think I've got a, a you know, 
I think it was well noted, you know, during the debates that I was the one person that wouldn't engage in, you know, inner candidate uh, criticism and conflict just to get a, a soundbite the next day or get another minute or two of talking time. I ran for president on three things, which was the economy, uh, which we need to be the world leader. And, and we've got a strong economy. I mean, Ronald Reagan showed us that's how you win a Cold War. I knew we were in a Cold War with China. People weren't saying that out loud a year ago, but I understood it. I understood we're in a cyber war every day because our state gets attacked by North Korea, uh, by China, by Iran, by Russia every day. Uh, and, and of course, we've got two really large you know, Air Force bases in our state, plus Space Force. So we've got you know, a missile wing and a bomber wing and, and uh, the, so the largest uh, UAS unmanned aerial system stuff going on at the Grand Forks and Minot Air Force bases. So I, you know, I understood from a, as, as it, from a national security standpoint where we were, and uh, we had candidates that were talking about a lot of things. But we weren't talking about national security. We weren't talking about the economy, and we weren't talking about how energy policy underpins all of that. Because when we start you know, trying to kill the U.S. energy industry and allow Iran, uh, their production to grow now up to 3.5 million barrels a day, uh, you know, North Dakota production is down since President Biden's been in office. Iran's production is up uh, like double, triple, quadruple from where they were. Russia's, you know, making so much money right now through these Swiss cheese sanctions. I mean, they're selling most of their oil 15 bucks ahead of the sanction level. So Russia's getting rich. Iran's getting rich. Iran's funding terrorism. They're funding Hamas. They're funding a war against us. Russia's getting rich. They're funding a war against uh, us. We're in two proxy wars now because of Joe Biden's uh, economic and energy policies. And so I was frustrated that no one was talking about that. So that's what I ran on. And of course, what do we, when I, when I, that was pre-October 7th, that was uh, before Iran, you know, launching uh, 500 missiles at, at Israel uh, and in us and the brink of World War III. So, and I was talking back. You go back on the tapes when I first started running. I said I've never, I've never talked to uh, you know our three kids about World War III before. But I started to over you know well over a year ago that this could happen if we kept going down with these policies. So, I was really in it for that reason. And then of course when I uh, when I dropped out uh, shortly thereafter that I was the first one to endorse President Trump. So you know my journey has been. Uh, supporting President Trump, I think you know a business guy in 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 the executive branch office. Great, you, you know your lawyers, great. Run for Senate, run for Congress. Uh, you know we they're the guys that make laws, but we need business leaders in our state houses, and we need them in the White House. And Joe Biden and and Harris, between the two of them, I don't think they've created one private sector job in either one of their careers. And and so then you know how do you understand the uh, what? The job creators are going through. They want to tax job creators. How do they understand what families and workers are going through? I mean, this is a it, it you know it it, it is the economy, uh, inflation, uh, the border the borders affecting our economy. With you know you can't have a mass invasion coming in like it is and not have it affect our economy at a state level. So that's uh, just more background, Will. But thanks for asking. Well. You know, no, I I appreciate that answer, and it gives me several things I want to follow up on here in the time that we have left together. But um, you're right, and I was going to ask you, you know, you staked a claim during those presidential debates on your hawkishness towards China. I was going to ask you, you know, what is it you know or why when it comes to China? And you began to give us your answer there. As a governor of North Dakota, you've seen the attacks, you know, from places like China, at least when it comes to cyber attacks, and we all know the economic policies as well. But then you brought up Russia. I'm curious, um, were you in the Trump administration? What would be your advice to Donald Trump on how to handle the war in Ukraine? Well, let me just give you one more thing on China, which is... uh uh, hasn't been told a lot, but as a young entrepreneur, I mean, let's go all the way back to 1989. I'm a kid. We're just starting to first sell our software, Great Plains accounting software, outside of North America. We were in U.S. and Canada. Uh, we knew that the easiest places to go next would be part of the, uh, you know, the the, the British uh, accounting system, if you will. So places like the U.K. and uh, <clears throat> Australia, because we had it working in Canada and a lot of similarities. So on the way back from uh, setting up our first uh, uh, distribution partnerships in Australia, I, I, you know, I thought, hey, I'll swing by China uh, because, you know, China had been, been opened up under Nixon. They were starting to look like they might have a commercial economy. Uh, there are a lot of people there. Uh, so anyway, I swing in there for a couple of days uh, as a young entrepreneur and I get there and then they say, oh, hey, they're, they're selling the U.S. software down at the street market. And I'm like, really? So I go down there, and at the time, I mean, you know, Lotus 123 was the leading spreadsheet, and I'm like, I sort of expected that they might be knocking off and pirating some of that. So as a half joke, I said, do you have any Great Plains? And the guy goes, yeah, right over here. 
we weren't selling outside huh. the U.S. and they were selling it for a buck for a five and a quarter inch floppy for each one of our, you know, general ledger was a buck, accounts payable was a buck. There's, I could have bought $25,000 of our software for $5 in a, in a Chinese street market. So when people say, oh, when did you, when did you start figuring out China? They've stolen every piece of software you know, after 30 years in that industry and across, you know, being involved with a dozen com- companies, uh, not just Great Plains and Microsoft. Uh, and being, you know, chairman of other global software companies, uh, you, you know, they can't be trusted. You can sell software in Japan, and they'll right. pay. They'll pay for ninety nine out of a hundred copies, just like in the U S. There is some piracy, but you know, China, you're lucky if they pay for one out of a hundred. So I've known that for a long time. In terms of Russia, uh, you know, this is a, a, a situation uh, again where. Uh, I feel like that Joe Biden's uh, weakness is what led to this whole thing. I mean, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, you know, was six months preceded, you know, his invasion. Joe Biden's on the record of making statements that as a, as a president and a diplomat were essentially greenlighting, uh, you know, Putin going in. I mean, somebody asked him, what would you do if he invaded? Well, it would depend on what kind of an invasion it was. I mean, like, uh, we're going to qualify it right. as opposed to no, you, you, you cross the line. So this is a, uh, again, failed, failed foreign policy by the Biden administration under President Trump. We were at peace. We didn't have we weren't having wars. I mean, we've started two proxy wars and the Cold War continues with China under under Joe Biden. And I, President Trump has said it himself uh, that, you know, on day one, he's going to try to find a negotiated solution, stop the killing. And I think he's the one guy on the planet that could do that. I only have a few more minutes with you, Governor, and I want to try to fit two questions in. First, I have to do this. I wouldn't uh, forgive myself if not. I I want you to address this other criticism when it comes to you, and that is your push for carbon-neutral policies in North Dakota. You have never forsaken fossil fuels. That's part of your career. You don't have to qualify that. You have been a supporter of fossil fuels, but you have pushed for alternative fuels and set a target for North Dakota at uh, carbon neutral, I believe. So um, why is that so important? Like, you know, I understand investing in innovation, but why even set the target? Why is, why is carbon neutrality important? Well, I think for us, it was a <clears throat> putting up a sign that said, hey, look, if you're one of these ESG companies that's, you know, spending trillions of dollars around the world uh, trying to get green, come spend them in North Dakota. Uh, and you don't have to spend them on alternative fuels because we could spend we can with with CO2 uh, capture and storage and CO2 uh, enhanced oil recovery. We've got an opportunity to decarbonize the internal combustion machine. I mean, my my effort around that is trying to save, you know, save the American pickup. I mean, save the American car. These EV policies of the Biden administration are literally of all the things they're doing. These are the things that are the most extremely uh, harmful to our economy. They're the things that help our adversaries mm-hmm. the most. Uh, the technology doesn't work. We don't have the we don't have a distribution system on our grid to sustain that. We need our grid to support AI and crypto and a lot of other things we're doing. So it is and, and there's a new report out just from Hoover Institute that it's costing over nine hundred dollars a ton, you know, for so for some kind of avoided emission theoretical thing, when we know that we can, uh, you know, right now we got two plants in North Dakota that are taking 100% of the CO2 off of ethanol. That's not an alternative fuel. That's E15 is in every car. So all of a sudden, hey, hey, Biden administration, we've now got a, a, a internal combustion machine that's 15% has less carbon emissions. Well, we've also got a company in North Dakota that's using CO2. They shove it down hole uh, into the oil field. They store 400 pounds of CO2 down more than the barrel of oil produces. They got a net net carbon negative barrel of oil right now today. They're greener than Patagonia. So if America wants to have zero carbon emissions, you don't need to buy an EV. We just need to be innovative about the liquid fuels. If you're on team liquid fuels, you're on team USA. And if you're on team EV, you're on team China. Last question. You've been a successful entrepreneur, Governor. Uh, as you mentioned, you mortgaged the family farm uh, that set you off on a path. I know one time the AP wrote about you as a chimney sweep business you started. Uh, Great Plains Software, huge success, sold to Microsoft. If anybody young or an aspiring entrepreneur of, of any age were listening to you right now, what would be the one piece of advice you would give them about their career? Well, first thing I would do is is uh, <clears throat> start off your day with a uh, um, <clears throat> a note of gratitude because the ability to start and create wealth and create companies and and have products that change people's lives. I mean, America is the place for entrepreneurs. I mean, if you want to start a company, this is where you want to start. Is in the U.S. I mean, we've got in spite of all the challenges we have, 
uh, and we want to continue to be that home for entrepreneurs and do that. But I would also just tell them, go for it. I mean, there's uh, uh, so many people that I meet along the way that are like they they, they you know they hear about about being involved in a startup and creating uh, opportunities for your team members and your customers and your partners and transforming, uh, you know, communities. And they're like, man, I had an idea, but I didn't do it. And so part of it is, you just got, you got to have the courage to go for it and, and go for it. And our, and our part of why America is the best for entrepreneurs is because we celebrate people who try and then try again, uh, as opposed to, you know, some countries have got a culture, which is risk-taking isn't part of it. And I, just, uh, you know, tell, what, what, one of the things I've always talked about is, uh, you know, gratitude. I've talked about humility because when you're an entrepreneur, you make mistakes. You, you get humbled by your competitors and by the markets and by changes in technology. Uh, but if you, don't, if you don't have that element of courage, uh, then, you know, then figure out a way to grow it uh, because that's what's needed if you want to jump into the arena, whether it's in politics or being an entrepreneur. Uh, these days, it, it, takes an element of, it takes an element of courage to jump in, and I would just – encourage all entrepreneurs, hey, just, you know, get your plan and go for it. Try and try again. Have courage. Reminds me, we can end on the theme of basketball, kind of where we started. Antoine Walker, famous uh, Boston Celtic, uh, was once asked about his low shooting percentage. He said, I'm a volume shooter. I'm a volume scorer. <laughs> uh, they want efficiency in basketball, but life, life is truly a volume shooting game. Just keep shooting. Have the courage to do it. Uh, Really enjoyed this. I could talk to you for another half hour. Uh, more about your entrepreneurial career, more about your personal relationship with Donald Trump. But you're always welcome to come back here on the Will Kane Show. And it's been fun getting to know you, Governor Doug Burgum. Thank you, Will. Great to be with you.